We're going to visit with Jim on Prime West and what they do in the various counties they serve. Just an outside view of the Prime West building in Alexandria, right north of Target on the Frontage Road and the Covenant Church. Inform TV, we're in the Prime West building, uh, the old Verizon building in Alexandria. We're going to get some insight on Prime West and what that does in various counties around rural America, or rural Minnesota, I should say. Uh, Jim, introduce yourself and give us a little background on yourself as well as your company here. Yes, my name is Jim Prisabilla, I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Prime West Health. I've been at Prime West since uh, 2001 and became the CEO at that time. Uh, I've been in rural health care since 1987 and health care since 1981. Uh, a little background on Prime West. Prime West is a unique organization. It's actually owned by a group of counties, 13 counties. Uh, these counties uh, wanted to do things a bit different than having private health plans run uh, the Medicaid program and the Medicare Advantage programs in these 13 counties, as that they are all rural, and most commercial health plans are located in the Twin Cities. So they thought by running the health plan themselves, they could be more sensitive to local needs. So these counties did form the organization in 1998, and then went through the rigorous process of applying for certification to become a health plan in the state of Minnesota. Um, after that, they competed for the contracts that the state puts out for Medicaid and then later for Medicare from the federal government, were successful. And today the 13 counties and Prime West serve 35,000 individuals who are enrolled in Medicaid and those enrolled in Medicare Advantage who are also eligible for Medicaid. Uh, the interesting geography of Prime West, we're headquartered in Alexandria in Douglas County, uh, but we have 13 counties that are pretty much spread from the Iowa border to uh, the Canadian border. And the reason for that is, is when the state uh, decided to allow, through legislation, allow counties to do health plan functions, not all counties wanted to do it. Uh, so the ones that did formed partnerships, which are known as joint powers agreements between governments, which is the uh, governmental term for a joint venture in the private sector. Um, and we, so we end up with uh, a county, Pipestone County, way down in the southwest. Uh, a little further to the north and east, we have Renville. Uh, Meeker and McLeod counties in that little three county cluster. Right around Douglas County we have Pope and Grant, Stevens and Traverse. A little further west we have Big Stone. And um, we go up north we have uh, Beltrami, Clearwater and Hubbard counties. So our geography is based on the counties who decided this is something they wanted to do. And they believe that by having the resource available, because it does come with significant resources, we are paying for the health care for 35,000 people, that decisions would be much more sensitive to the local providers who serve them and to the members we serve. As far as uh, the, the insurers in, uh, I'm sure my audience is wondering, Jim, how do you fit in with uh, Minsure, for mm -hmm. example? How do you fit in with United Healthcare? We had preferred sure. one that was uh, involved in, in uh, uh, Minsure and now pulled out. Give us a little thought process that way. Well, first of all, we don't serve a commercial population. The population we serve are individuals who have lower incomes that make them eligible for Medicaid and Minnesota Care and also for Medicare Advantage, but the ones that we serve that are Medicare are low-income seniors or individuals with disabilities. Um, so they're eligible for what they call public insurance or public program coverage. Um, so the only thing we're on the exchange for, Minsure, is for enrollment for people into Medicaid and for the Minnesota Care Program, which is now on Minsure as the Minnesota's basic health plan. And from a standpoint then, are you the insurer? Or are you still using private insurers? I, I, I clarify no, that we, a little. We function just like a private insurer, only the source of funding, instead of coming from an employer, comes from tax dollars through the state of Minnesota for Medicaid and from the federal government for Medicare. So in essence, what the state and the federal government are doing are contracting with us to perform the health plan function locally for those 35,000 individuals. Is uh, in the process then uh, cost control, is that your number one function or the counties that uh, Prime West is made up of, of, of streamlining or give us a little thought on that? Well the number one priority is making sure that these individuals who are vulnerable because of economic status have access to health care like the rest of us. Um, so that's our number one priority. After that, we want to ensure that the health care that they're getting is delivered with quality and then at a fair price. And that's where the cost comes in. We want to make sure that the services that are provided are medically necessary 
and needed by the individual, but above all, it's making sure that our individuals can access the needed health care they need in a timely manner. And from a standpoint of the, your model, what are the counties? Obviously, we have a number of counties in the area that could become part of you, I would think. Uh, are, how, do you, how do you see that uh, shaking out? Well, that's a good question. We started out as 10 counties. The three northern counties, Bill, Trammy, Clearwater, and Hubbard, they joined us in 2008. We'd already been in business with the southern 10 counties for five years. Um, those counties were not yet under what they call managed care, and that's basically what we do. Uh, the state has a set of contracts with health plans to deliver care locally. Um, they had still been under, under an old program and had yet to make the decision to either have the state contract with private health plans or they themselves do what we do at Prime West to be the health plan themselves as counties. Um, when push came to shove, they thought it would be easier and more expeditious if they could join Prime West. So our counties uh, put the criteria together that we would to allow additional counties to join Prime West and those counties pretty much hit all the checks in a positive way and it was a decision made by the existing 10 counties to uh, uh, invite them to join Prime West. Um, since our beginning, uh, because we have been successful, other counties have approached us, but um, they haven't met the criteria that we need, the, the owner counties need to, to make that happen. We continue to get approached, but again we kind of hold up that same criteria that's been developed by our owner counties because they are looking for a good match, a good chemistry between the counties in terms of how this organization is governed, what's the philosophy, because it is a very much a locally driven philosophy. It's not about the dollars, it's about the access and to care and the, the efficient delivery of health care. Um, so our expansion is pretty much the last time we really expanded was in 2008 with the northern counties. We don't anticipate it growing to uh, additional counties, at least in the foreseeable future. You know, uh, um, in this whole process of health care uh, with the Minshear project and uh, the preferred one, uh, can give us a little overthought as far as how you as a health professional see uh, the health process uh, evolving with uh, the new health environment. Uh, now we've got change in Congress, uh, yet uh, we still have... Uh, um, basically this, the uh, same legislative bra uh, branches that we changed uh, uh, a leadership uh, with the Republicans in the House. Give us a, a little overview on your thought of health care and, and of course relating to mm -hmm. you and our, and our communities. Sure. A big part of the Affordable Care Act or also known as Obamacare was really the first part was extending access to health care coverage so people could afford to seek and get health care. Um, the big part that it's focusing on now, and that was going to be the enrollment through the exchanges, the health insurance exchanges, which in Minnesota is called Minsure. Um, the big emphasis I think where we're heading now is what can we do to continue to finance that, because when we extend access through the taxpayer dollar, it's going to end up to be an economic equation. Can we afford to sustain that access over an extended period of time? Uh, so part of the ACA does contemplate um, greater accountability for cost across the whole system. So I think where we're going to head now is greater provider, healthcare provider accountability in the cost equation. And that's known in, in, in healthcare reform now as accountable care. So there's more arrangements, whereas it used to be we pay providers, um, you pay providers basically on their volume, the more services they provide, the more we pay them. It's more toward also in addition to that, or a bit of that would move over to what we call a fee for value. Are we getting a good quality outcome? Is the individual returning to the quality of life they enjoyed before the, the onset of the illness or, or disease or accident? Um, is that care delivered in the most cost-effective manner? Um, are the uh, tools and the, the therapies that are being delivered, are those the ones that will uh, render the most cost-effective outcome? And cost-effective is both a quality and cost equation. I think when people think of cost-effective, they only think of the the cost side, did we reduce costs? Well, you can easily reduce costs by nipping quality, uh, but we the cost effectiveness equation is a value equation, and we want to make sure that um, that the value we get for the healthcare spend is there. And of course, the United States leads the country in terms of, leads the world in terms of expenditures, in terms of a per capita basis. But at the same time, our healthcare status as a population ranks quite low among uh, developed nations around the world. So at that trend, the health system that we have today is not sustainable. 
So, example, I, I, I'm a little confused. My audience is maybe sure. much sharper on, on this thought process, but I, I, I sense uh, their question. Of the 35,000 mm -hmm. clients that you have insured, would it best be described that they were with a preferred one, uh, or are, are you guys the, the, the insurer? Yeah, in, in, in the 13 counties we have, we are the insurer. They wouldn't have come from another health plan for the Medicaid program or Medicare Advantage. Uh, when they're enrolled with Prime West, we're pretty much the only pro uh, health payer in those programs in our 13 counties. On the Minnesota Care program, there might be another health care payer, and that would likely be Blue Cross, uh, perhaps Medica or UCARE. So preferred one was strictly a commercial plan. They did not do anything in the public programs. So when you have to separate, when you look at the exchange, the exchange is used for people who are self-insured, who are ineligible for, um, when you think of commercial, those are people who are ineligible for public programs, either through Medicaid or Medicare. So they go to the, to the exchange to enroll, and with that they put in their financial information. And from the exchange then they are given the options for coverage. If their income status is at a certain point that would make them eligible for Medicaid, for example, they would automatically be rolled in Prime West since there's not another care, uh, Medicaid plan in our 13 counties. One of the other things, obviously, uh, you explained the, the areas are all rural Minnesota and for the most part these rural counties are not growing. Do you foresee that uh, uh, your organization here, Prime West, We'll probably have 35,000 people uh, five years from now, or where did you come from? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. And first of all, as of December of 2013, Prime West enrollment was at 25,000. Oh. And after the Affordable Care Act, with the expansion of Medicaid eligibility, that means they increased the income level that people could be eligible for Medicaid. We increased by over 10,000 individuals in the course of since the beginning of 2014. Um, our membership isn't so much driven by the total population of the county as it is more of the economics of a county. Where would the, uh, when you say that, I didn't mean to interrupt you, we keep on with your no. thought there, but uh, where, where are the income ranges with, would be typical with these 35,000? Oh, 000? that's a good question, and I really don't have that off the top of my head, because they do that as a, as a, a percent of the federal poverty guidelines. Okay. And I, frankly, at that point, enrollment is really a function of MNSHA. So I really don't get into those eligibility levels. But if you go on the Minsher website, they will tell you those different eligibility categories for the different programs. Um, but the folks that are eligible for Medicaid, those are not, they're, they're in jobs, if they have jobs, those aren't paying jobs. Those aren't well-paying jobs. And uh, even with Minnesota Care, which is the basic health plan, those folks are not going to be in the best paying jobs. So that makes them eligible for the program. They can also be for eligible from circumstance in life. Uh, uh, a female, for example, who's making an okay income uh, gets pregnant. Then by virtue of the pregnancy becomes eligible for Medicaid and along with the baby. Um, so there's different criteria. So to be able to give you one kind of quick sure. grid of how it looks, especially depicting it here uh, orally and verbally like this, um, it's a bit difficult. What, what about, uh, obviously, in rural uh, Minnesota, um, we have a lot of seniors mm -hmm. that, that uh, may have low income as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what percentage of this 35,000, you have a rough idea mm -hmm. a little bit, that are, are, are uh, retirees compared sure. to or eligible mm -hmm. as seniors? And uh, do you consider a senior starting at 55 like ARP or, yeah. or do you start at 60, that type of thing, Jim? It's based on the Medicare. And Medicare starts at age 65. Okay. So that's who's eligible. And if they have the income levels, that um, make them eligible for Medicaid, they get both, both their Medicaid and their Medicare coverage through Prime West. Okay. So, that's, so it's the lower income seniors that we serve. And that's roughly, of our 35,000, about 2,500 are seniors. And uh, uh, from a standpoint then, as far as how do you see cost uh, for a number of years, you know, healthcare mm -hmm. was going up, uh, three to four times uh, the cost of inflation, or the rate of inflation, I should say. Where, where do you see uh, what you're dealing with as far as uh, um, going forward to 15? What, what do you think the cost is going to be up for your organization? Public programs like Medicaid and Medicare are somewhat insulated from those because they, the federal government and the state government set the rates, and those are set by the legislature. So they can depress what's paid. In terms of uh, in terms of avoiding what is the healthcare trend that you would experience in commercial plans, 
Um, this translates usually to lower reimbursement rates to healthcare providers than from what they're uh, accustomed to receiving from commercial health plans that yeah, you and I would receive from employers. Um, so that tends to then defy or flatten what would be the trends you see typically in the healthcare inflation. Obviously you're talented, but an organization like this has a board of directors. Who, who <laughs> are your bosses or who do you report to? I have uh, 26 bosses, so I have two county commissioners from each of the uh, Prime West counties. One serves as the primary, the voting member, the other is the alternate. Uh, from Douglas County, it's uh, a Bev Bales and a currently Dan Olson um, serve on the Prime West Board from Douglas County. Okay, and, and from a standpoint, uh, what kind of reaction or what, uh, in a typical meeting of our, our mm -hmm. county commissioners in this area, because well, we cover a number of the counties, uh, not just Douglas here, what, what would be the focus of a typical board meeting where Bev Bales mm -hmm. would be representing the, sure. the people of, of Douglas County? Well, it's, they're not the most exciting uh, meetings because it's a monthly meeting of the board and uh, typically it's uh, attended by just about uh, all the alternates as well as the primary. So um, we go through the financials. Uh, we go quite a bit on how, we, how, we, how we're using our dollars and, and tracking that. Uh, we go through updates of what's happening in the environment in terms of care delivery for our members. Uh, also what's happening at the legislature and federal government affecting us. Um, the, because we're a very regulated industry, as a health insurance plan, there's a lot of policies and procedures that they have to review and approve in the thousands. So we spend a lot of time going through the different policies and procedures, keeping them up to date to keep Prime West in compliance. But then also they do things like um, uh, approving uh, dollar amounts that we put out for grant programs. Prime West, because we're government owned, we don't really have the need for the profit to sit or to develop uh, other commercial plans, for example. Our dollars are used then to, to do better for our individual uh, members in terms of increasing access and the quality of care. And we do that to grants to uh, the healthcare providers and other community groups who serve them. Um, just recently, for example, the board approved uh, $5 million in grants, which we just awarded across the 13 counties and some providers outside uh, to do just that. So those are some of the things they do. And then strategically, how do we position the organization going forward? Are there other, other met ne unmet needs that it's appropriate for the government to step in, or the public sector? It's very much a strong belief by all the county commissioners that government does what the private sector won't do. So that's the time for government. We really don't want to compete with the private sector. It's really, they see that this is a, an area that wasn't being well served by the commercial or the private sector, that's then the role of government to fill that gap. When you have that large group of uh, board of directors then uh, sitting at a meeting, uh, what will be the financial triggers that uh, uh, get one of your board members to raise his eyebrows a little bit or, or what are they looking mm -hmm. for when, when they're analyzing this operation sure. here in Alexandria? They'll look at the different expenditures. Do we see a spike in a certain area of healthcare expenses, maybe uh, a particular month or two? And in healthcare, you don't really measure on a monthly basis. It's usually quarterly or annually or semi-annually at least that you're looking for a trend. And they may say, we've got a trend in uh, hospital inpatient, what's going on there? And then us as management and staff uh, give them the situations that are contributing, for example, for those higher costs. Fortunately, Prime West has actually been seeing over the last year or two a decrease in cost. I think we're 4% below our past four-year average in healthcare spending. And that's a good, I think, is a tribute to providers who become uh, very conscious, cost conscious, and uh, members who are seeking health care in an appropriate manner. What about the, the Minshire uh, uh, exchange that was put together? You said you've been in business now a number of years mm -hmm. here. Um, uh, how did Minshire affect an organization such as this in our county? Yeah, because we're a public program, it really didn't affect us. We don't go on there putting a commercial plan. It's more that the state is using that as a vehicle, an electronic vehicle for enrollment purposes. So individuals who in the past for Medicaid eligibility would go to their county financial assistance office, they now can go online to Minshire or at one of the kiosks if they don't have access at home to the internet. To, uh, to enroll electronically and let the state then determine the eligibility. That was always done in the past by counties in a very much a paper heavy uh, process. We have mixed fe feelings about that. We believe that the individual when they enrolled at the county, it was an opportunity for an individual, a human, to have contact with that individual to assess need. Now that's done electronically. 
And uh, while it may be more efficient in many ways, so once they work the bugs out of Minsure, uh, the promise is to be more efficient. Uh, we're concerned that the human touch has been being taken out a bit by Minsure. Did you know that clients recover more quickly at home than at a hospital or other nursing care facility? Knut Nelson Home Care can provide you or your loved one with nursing care and many other support services all in the comfort of your home. Learn more about how we can help you live exceptionally well at KnutNelson.org. Hi, my name is Lane Kalena, General Manager of Farmers Union Oil Company in Alexandria. Um, we have a location also in Garfield, convenience store. Um, we deal in uh, bulk fuels, propane, uh, we have two convenience stores, a full service shop, tire department, and whenever you're coming by our location on Broadway or Garfield, we invite you to stop in and check out all the things we have to offer. Um, we are a cooperative and we do pay dividends to our customers and it is a uh, true locally owned co-op where we are self-sufficient, we're owned by our members and all dividends, anything that's made here is paid back to our customers. So stop in and check us out and buy a tank of gas. Remember to get your tanks filled at Sun and Alexandria. You're watching Inform TV, Alexandria, Minnesota. One uh, example I'm looking at, uh, at your geographic area, mm -hmm. the counties, and you had talked earlier about qualifying. Uh, for example, it looks like Todd County, Sturgeons County, uh, uh, to the east, and, and as well as Candy, Ohio, and Swift, and Chip, a lot of those sure. south of us. What reason would they qualify for, or what, and if they don't qualify, uh, don't become part of this organization, what are they doing different than the counties in your organization? Well, and when the state set up the program, we'll go back in history a bit, um, back in the 80s, the state of Minnesota was really experiencing uh, skyrocketing Medicaid costs. At that time, the state paid health care providers directly. There was no health plans involved. What they did then, in, in the mid-80s, they decided to develop a, a demonstration project where they contracted with a few health plans to serve a few counties. And the proposition is, you're going to get only so much per member per month that we have enrolled in your plan to deliver this set of benefits that's defined by the state. Um, the, the health plans have to decide whether they want to do it at the payment rate that you get from the state. That's known as a risk-based contract. Now, if the health plan spends more, well, then the health plan has to make up the difference with its own dollars. However, if the health plan spends less, those are profits that the health plan can keep. Um, that was demonstrated in the 80s. And uh, to great success, for the most part, the state thought, at putting a control on cost, because no longer was it just kind of the state uh, just to have a deeper and deeper pocket as healthcare spending went up. They had an ability to project what their costs would be based on their rates that they set with plans. So the state risk was capped with the contract with the health plan. It gets a bit complex, but what it is is the state's basically saying, here's how much we're going to pay. It's up to you to stay under that. Where in the past, the state's expenses would just go up with Medicaid because it was just a direct pay to the state, to the provider. Now it's more of a control that they cap their costs at whatever they're into for those health plans. Uh, it was during that demonstration project that it completed into the early 90s that the state decided to roll it out statewide. So it was traditionally going to be set up with the state contracting with the health plans, which are basically Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Medica, UCARE, um, health partners, and preferred one. Um, and those were going to be the traditional private plans, those were the HMOs that were operating in the state at the time. But there were concerns by rural counties that those were all metropolitan-based health plans and that they could establish a provider network that would still meet state access standards but could, m might be able to get by without having contracts with local providers. So local providers approached counties and said, we have to do something about this or we're going to lose patients. So that's when the counties decided to get into the game and say, can we become health plan? And passed legislation in the mid-1990s to become health plans, uh, as long as we played by the same rules as the health plans, as, uh, in terms of certifications and, and, and regulatory environment and, and compliance. Um, so now the counties, once we got into the game, now the counties are accepting that risk contract with the state. So that's why the finances are a very big interest to the county, because obviously if we spend more than we earn, we have no place to go but the county taxpayer. 
So how Prime West is structured is, is that we make sure that we operate a very efficient business and we develop a reserve fund that we use to insulate ourselves from ever having to go to the county tax dollar. And since Prime West has been in existence, we've never needed it. There's never been a county tax dollar to support Prime West. Prime West is entirely supported by the contracts we have with the state or federal government. With if, it, if it wasn't for Prime West, those contracts would be in Minneapolis or St. Paul with the private health plans. So the, the strategy was we can be locally sensitive. We have potential to have profits or surplus, as they're called in government, that can be reinvested into the community that otherwise, if they were under contract with private plans, the local community would never be able to possibly see. So those other counties, during that process, they made a decision whether they wanted to do what they call, what we do call, county-based purchasing, or simply go with the flow and go with the private health plans um, as they were rolling this out statewide. Our counties basically said no and held off and held off until we went through the process. Um, in the meantime, the other counties were enrolling with private, private health plans. Um, you mentioned a couple counties that actually went with another group just like us. We're not the only ones in the state. There's another group that's headquartered out of uh, Owatonna. And that's actually where Todd and Morrison counties are actually a part of that group. Stearns County, for example, um, and some of the others that you mentioned, uh, they do their contracts still with the, the private sector. A um, bit more complicated in metropolitan areas because there's certain federal regulations that make our type of uh, program difficult to operate in metropolitan counties, which is Stearns County, as so it designated as a metro county. And as, as far as uh, understanding the overall picture of, of how many employees now do you have in your mm -hmm. new facility here? Uh, 157 at the present time. And uh, being your county-based or consider yourself a government right. organization, is that right, Jim? Right. What, what would those 150 people be doing on a typical day? Well, it's a whole lot of, a whole variety of activities that we do. We are a full functioning health plan. That means that we process claims and that the claim is basically the bill we receive from the health care provider who delivers the service to our member. Um, we process about a million claims a year. So that's significant. And our health care spending is approaching about 200 million a year that we wow. spend on health care. So we do a lot of that. We're also responsible for individuals who have chronic disease uh, or complex medical conditions to coordinate their health care. So that involves uh, uh, quite a few nurses and social services individuals to coordinate care in uh, collaboration with county public health and social services and the medical community to ensure that the individuals are getting the care and treatment and disease management therapy that they, they need. Um, we are also responsible under federal and state law to ensure that the health care is delivered with quality, that the, it's a quality product that's being delivered or service being delivered by health care providers. And that's a very rigorous uh, regulatory process where we devote a lot of time looking at a lot of data, doing a lot of on-site visits with providers to ensure that the service was medically necessary and was delivered with a, a degree of quality. One of, one of the things that I, I, I'm I'm thinking about in this process. We talked about the state. Uh, the, the the Senate is still controlled by uh, the Democratic Party. They still have a governor that can veto. So uh, the Minsure exchange, I would think, would be quite safe yet, even though there will probably be some shake up there. But on a federal uh, basis, and you are, are telling us uh, a big part of your money comes both from state and federal, and now all of a sudden we've got a Senate and House is controlled by the Republicans who. Uh, hate uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, yeah. with a, a passion. Um, what, what potential do you see as far as changes in, in a, what you're doing if uh, uh, the Obamacare process would change? Or uh, As it affects us, we don't see a whole lot um, with Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, largely, the Affordable Care Act were for uh, individuals who are going to need to go to the commercial, the uninsured, who could afford uh, if it was made more affordable, private insurance. Um, there was obviously the, the increase in the eligibility level for others to become eligible for Medicaid, um, but that's largely federally subsidized for a few more years. Uh, it'll be more down the road when more of that dollar that Medicaid spend has to come from the state uh, versus the federal government right now in terms of the, the match level that I think we'll see some things, but that's not for a few years yet. Um, so there's not a whole lot on either side of the aisle, Republican or Democrat, that really, uh, really tinkers a whole lot with the Medicaid program itself. Um, you can imagine it's politically 
uh, difficult to navigate waters when you're dealing with very vulnerable populations, whether they be seniors under Medicare, which is the federal government and Congress's deal, or Medicaid, which is a state legislature's deal. Um, so largely they focus on are the benefits appropriate, are they priced correctly, are we paying providers too much, are we paying providers too, as I mentioned, Medicaid, the state sets the Medicaid rate. They do more of that. Um, and there hasn't been a whole lot of dramatic movement necessarily. There's been things that they tinker around. It's a very big law that they tinker around, but there hasn't been anything that kind of cut to the soul that would be uh, a game changer for Medicaid in Minnesota. Um, maybe for Prime West in a small degree. Um, but more often than not, there's uh, the trend had been to increase the Medicaid benefit, increase the number of can be eligible. We may see some changes of that, but down the road. Obviously, uh, my, you're lucky I didn't remember to uh, put in my clock to see how much time we've, we've actually put away. But uh, I, I'm sure my audience, as we get towards the closing end here, uh, you're part of the healthcare industry. Well, when you go to a meeting or talk to some of the insurers, your friends, whatever, uh, can you give us maybe just a little insight why in, in men's your preferred one was the dominant provider and all of a sudden, boom, they're just out. Like, uh, how could they go from night to day or not see? What's the industry spin on it? You know, when, you, when you're a health plan, and even when Prime West each year sets our budget, which I'm in the process of doing now, um, you have to project how much health care is going to cost you on a per member per month basis is basically what it is and um, it's sometimes uh, health care is a tricky business you can go just like an individual consider your own health you're, you're, you're having a great day you're having a great year then all of a sudden you become very sick um, now you take that across to thousands and in some cases millions of lives and you have to control for that risk um, my hunch is with preferred one, they, they put in their estimates the, that they aim low. And the, uh, their, prior, their product that they priced on there was underpriced and that they were losing money if they would continue to have that, that product on Minsure. So instead of doing that, they pulled that out. So I think it was purely a financial. And then just because this is a whole, there's a lot of people now on these exchanges, both in Minnesota and federal and nationally that we had no real read on on how they were going to use health care. So if you undershot and estimated they wouldn't use health care as much as they ultimately did uh, and you priced your product too low in terms of the premium, um, then your financial shortfalls. One of the things I think we see a trend, in fact, I, I uh, uh, sat with a businessman having a bite to eat over the weekend and uh, uh, he was talking about uh, he's in the fast food business and all of a sudden they're looking into the, the Minsure mm -hmm. program, the Obamacare. I'm a firm believer over a period of time um, all industry is going to go that way. We'll have government uh, uh, insurance similar to Canada, Japan, Europe. I don't know what your thought is and I, I welcome you to comment on that. But at the same time, um, you probably meet or run into them at times. Uh, let's say example that uh, uh, in, in Minnesota here compared to Manitoba, uh, just north of us here, uh, what's your thought as far as uh, the, the state of Manitoba, uh, their general population compared to the average Minnesotan here? Uh, are are uh, countries like Canada, are they providing health care much cheaper and without the, the layers of insurance companies, bureaucracies? Any thought on that, Jim? Oh, only what I read and what a lot of other folks read. But you well. understand it yeah, a little bit. I do. That's what and, I'm and, getting and at. Again, it, it really depends. I think there's a lot to be said about the, the, the marketplace that we have. Um, we have problems with what we have here because we do if, if, if face medical inflation. And there's a lot of reasons why health care costs here are more. We hear often, in the drug industry is a perfect example, why can I purchase medications in the United States that's this price and I can go to Canada and it's a much lesser price. Um, that has to do with how pharmaceutical manufacturers price their product. They know that they can get away, you know, basically the market will bear it in the United States and may not in, in, in foreign trade. Uh, that might be affecting it to a degree. Um, my concern when something's 100% government um, is that the competitive edge I think among providers, there's always, I think the providers want to excel in, in their chosen profession. But I think there's that extra edge, and I think that's because we're American, and there's that extra edge that we're in a competitive environment. And when doctors are competing, I think it's a pride thing. 
when they're competing against others. I don't know if that's the culture or not can exist when everything's 100% government. But then the government, that's a big ticket. That's a big cost. I think it's a decision the United States will have to come to grips with. A big chunk of tax payer dollars would be replacing right now, which is in the, in the private industry, between the payroll check that we get as an employee, transferring over to a payer. Can the federal and state government operate as a health plan and, for example, collect all commercial pay and then themselves turn around? The United States has not shown it has the capacity either at state levels or at the federal government levels to do that uh, with a degree of efficiency to satisfy the private health care providers that deliver it. Prime West does not deliver health care itself. We pay for the health care. We have contracts with over 6,000, uh, it might be closer to 8,000 providers in four different states who have certain expectations. Um, prompt payment, uh, accurate payment, um, and a fair regulatory process that goes with it. Um, our experiences as providers are very satisfied with what we do and may not be so satisfied sometimes the way they're the, 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 when working with the government, the federal or state government. Um, I think that that drive, that pressure that providers have put pressure on us as payers, health plans, to do the best we can. Will that pressure be as, uh, as strong of a lever with a government, a federal or state government bureaucracy as it is with commercial payers and payers like us that we won't stay in business if we're not uh, in partnership or doing things consistent with the, the desires of our, of our providers as much as possible. I think that's where the debate will happen. So I think it will fall more down to quality of care and, and, and satisfaction of providers, which then will lead to the satisfaction of care the individual may receive from those providers. Um, big question you ask, and there's a lot of different answers. You hear all kinds of things. Quality of care is better in some countries that have uh, socialized medicine, if you will, uh, than the United States, maybe. Um, I think it depends what indicators you look at. I always found where statistics will say one story through one person's mouth, and the person will look at the same st set of statistics and, and he'll, he'll say something else. I think the issue will really boil down to whether this country is willing to move that much over to a government base and then the trust we have in government. And right now, my sense of the American public is not a big trust in big government. So we're kind of caught in that. And we've been caught in that for 30 years. We've been debating this for a long time. Before I let you do a summary or a thought process of something you may have missed or, or want to make sure that the uh, taxpayers in the counties that I cover here, uh, as far as the, the overall picture then of uh, uh, looking at what you people do as a government agency, is that the correct term? And that you said you've grown 10,000 uh, clients. Uh, where do you expect, uh, if you stay with the same uh, counties, 13 counties, how many uh, clients will you serve in your projections at least uh, in five years from now or 10 years, whatever you do for, We're for following, projections? We have to follow kind of, this is where I was getting back, it's really not so much the numbers of people in terms of the populations of our 13 counties, it's more of the, the economies of those counties. Mm -hmm. um, because we're dealing with people who are right on the borderline of their, their income status, that any change in a major local employer closes up, people become displaced from jobs, they become eligible for Prime West. Um, right now, for example, Beltrami County, Bemidji's County, uh, that's one of our poorest. And they have about 15 or 16 percent of their population is enrolled in Prime West. Whereas Douglas County is more around 8 to 9 percent of the population. Similarly, uh, Douglas County and McLeod County are two wealthier counties, have similar. Um, it's more of that. And uh, then the rest of our counties are having the aging as more and more people are advancing. Uh, in age, they start spending away their dollars that they've saved through the retirement and so forth. They sell their farms and use up those assets. And as they age and use those up, they find their income starts to make them eligible and increasingly for Medicaid. So more seniors will be doing that. So we're starting just to start seeing that as seniors start to spend down their, uh, their, their incomes that they saved for the retirement because they're living longer. The retirement dollars are not going so far uh, as they used to. So it's more of a matter of economy in each county than anything. And when you say, obviously, uh, the baby boomers, uh, uh, and we have more people, we got Tanud Nelson, for yeah. example, here, uh, um, nursing homes. Does a fair amount of, of your uh, um, organization involve with people in long-term oh, sure. health care? Sure, because we're dealing with the seniors population. 
uh, a significant number of the individuals with disabilities. We're using a lot, a lot of the uh, long-term uh, long care support systems. Uh, Canoe Nelson, for example, is a very valuable provider in our network. Uh, which delivers more than just skilled nursing and, and, and nursing home care, but does a lot to keep people in their homes as well. So we have a lot of providers like Canute throughout our 13 counties and, our, and of our six to 8,000 uh, providers under contract with Prime West. So a big part of what we're doing with them is that's another part of what Prime West does. We have a significant number of people who are devoted to provider relations, whether that be our call center for providers to call with questions and concerns, uh, but also contracting and uh, bringing forth proposals they think for better ideas to deliver care to our members. Um, so yeah, that'll be an increasing growth area with the baby boomers, um, especially as baby boomers spend down. But what we're finding is that age where people become Medicaid eligible, meaning they spent down their resources to the point they're not eligible for Medicaid, that number's pushing back because I think the, the baby boomer generation was probably, particularly the latter half, were the ones that were probably more into the retirement programs that we're seeing now. A lot of people in the early uh, baby boomer period uh, were just becoming familiar with what are pretty new phenomenons, were retirement plans. It used to be the pension programs offered through our employers. Well, that changed. Uh, a lot more individual things. And I think people have um, saved up and they'll live longer into their 60s and 70s before they become to the point economically where they're going to need or be eligible for Medicaid. So that's kind of a counter force that's happening in terms of enrollment into Prime West. I think the average age of a senior who enrolls in Prime West for the first time is 79. Okay, so, yeah. and that's, that's right up there. You've been very kind with your uh, time. It almost looks like Christmas Eve. We got some more snow <laughs> coming down out there, and so it looks like we're gonna have a, a real winter again, or potentially anyway, starting this early. Um, Give us some, uh, a little summary of what we've been talking to, as well as maybe address some of the questions you're thinking. Why hasn't Alan asked this, that type of thing, Jim, and we'll get out of your way here. You've been very thorough. Um, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is, is that Prime West was designed to be locally owned. Uh, we are government, but that's simply because it would be very impractical and difficult for a local group to get together as a private group and start a health insurance company. Um, the idea was with local responsibility, and accountability and, and, and then sensitivity to the, to the needs of our members because things delivered in rural areas is much different than a metro and from one county to the next. And by living among and being with our providers and our members, we believe that's a strength of Prime West that other health plans can't be. So we really strive to really be in tune as much as possible and much of our resources and regulation allow to really meet in, in the, the needs and interests of our members and providers on a very local basis. And that's what sets Prime West apart. And uh, that will be the, continues to set us apart as long as we're one of the unique organizations like ours in the state of Minnesota. An organization like this, uh, at some point in time now, you're quite new in the building. Uh, should the, the, the taxpayers in this area uh, look for an open house, or that's something you can't do with your structure? Well, we, we will. We plan to do it. We're deciding whether we want to do it in winter or not. Um, so we do plan to do it. And matter of fact, this, this building in Douglas County is fortunate to be the host because it has, Prime West has a significant economic impact, not just on Douglas County, but also in Pope and Grant, Stevens. We have people coming as far as Traverse County to Prime West who work for Prime West. Uh, eight or nine million dollar payroll uh, stays locally. Um, we believe it's a community. Uh, this. So you will see in the front of the building, you will see flagpoles, quite a few of them. It will look like the little UN, but each one of those will be a flag of our owner counties. Our large conference room that we're in the process of finishing, that's going to be a community conference room that will open up to the public to use free of charge uh, for community meetings. Okay. Uh, all I can say is thanks for talking to Inform TV. It was very good, Jim. Thank you very much, Alan. Welcome to the Depot Express. If you're ever in Alexandria, please stop by. Nightly specials and happy hour seven days a week. Come enjoy our upstairs entertainment. We have pool tables, dartboards, jukebox. We have a DJ every weekend. And we have our huge salad bar available seven days a week. Come join us for a meal in our spacious downstairs dining room. If you have a larger group, we can accommodate you in our upstairs dining area. You can seat about 75 people up here. Did you know that clients recover more quickly at home than at a hospital or other nursing care facility? Knut Nelson Home Care can provide you or your loved one with nursing care and many other support services all in the comfort of your home. Learn more about how we can help you live exceptionally well at KnutNelson.org. You're watching Inform TV, Alexandria, Minnesota. So to be able to give you one kind of 
quick sure. grid of how it looks, especially depicting it here uh, orally and verbally like this. Um, it's a bit difficult. What, what about, uh, obviously, in rural uh, Minnesota, um, we have a lot of seniors mm-hmm. that, that uh, may have low income as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, what percentage of this 35,000, you have a rough idea mm-hmm. a little bit, that are, are, are uh, retirees compared sure. to or eligible mm-hmm. as seniors? And uh, do you consider seniors starting at 55 like ARP or yeah. are, do you start at 60, that type of thing, Jim? It's based on the Medicare. And Medicare starts at age 65. Okay. So that's who's eligible. And if they have the income levels, that um, make them eligible for Medicaid, they get both, both their Medicaid and their Medicare coverage through Prime West. Okay. So that's, that's so it's the lower income seniors that we serve. And that's roughly, of our 35,000, about 2,500 are seniors. And uh, uh, from a standpoint then, as far as how do you see cost uh, for a number of years, you know, healthcare mm-hmm. was going up, uh, three to four times uh, the cost of inflation, or the rate of inflation, I should say. Where, where do you see uh, what you're dealing with as far as uh, um, going forward to 15? What, what do you think the cost is going to be up for your organization? Public programs like Medicaid and Medicare are somewhat insulated from those because they, the federal government and the state government set the rates, and those are set by the legislature. So they can depress what's paid. In terms of uh, in terms of avoiding what is the healthcare trend that you would experience in commercial plans, um, this translates usually to lower reimbursement rates to healthcare providers than from what they're uh, accustomed to receiving from commercial health plans that yeah, you and I would receive through employers. Um, so that tends to then defy or flatten what would be the trends you see typically in the healthcare inflation. Obviously, you're talented, but an organization like this has a board of directors. Who, who are your bosses or who do you report to? I have uh, 26 bosses. So I have two county commissioners from each of the uh, Prime West counties. One serves as the primary, the voting member, the other is the alternate. Uh, from Douglas County, it's uh, a Bev Bales and a currently Dan Olson um, serve on the Prime West board from Douglas County. Okay, and, and from a standpoint, uh, what kind of reaction or what, uh, in a typical meeting of our, our mm-hmm. county commissioners in this area, because well, we cover a number of the counties, uh, not just Douglas here, what, what would be the focus of a typical board meeting where Bev Bales mm-hmm. would be representing the, sure. the people of, of Douglas County? Well, it's, they're not the most exciting uh, meetings because it's a monthly meeting of the board, and uh, typically it's uh, attended by just about uh, all the alternates as well as the primary. So um, we go through the financials. Uh, we go quite a bit on how, we, how, we, how we're using our dollars and, and tracking that. Uh, we go through updates of what's happening in the environment in terms of care delivery for our members. Uh, also what's happening at the legislature and federal government affecting us. Um, the, because we're a very regulated industry, as a health insurance plan is not sustainable. So, example, I, I, I'm a little confused. My audience is maybe sure. much sharper on, on this thought process, but I, I, I sense uh, their question. Of the 35,000 mm-hmm. clients that you have insured, would it best be described that they were with a preferred one, uh, or are, are you guys the, the, the insurer? Yeah, in, in, in the 13 counties we have, we are the insurer. They wouldn't have come from another health plan for the Medicaid program or Medicare Advantage. Uh, when they're enrolled with Prime West, we're pretty much the only pro- uh, health payer in those programs in our 13 counties. On the Minnesota Care program, there might be another health care payer, and that would likely be Blue Cross, uh, perhaps Medica or UCARE. So preferred one was strictly a commercial plan. They did not do anything in the public programs. So when you have to separate, when you look at the exchange, the exchange is used for people who are self-insured, who are ineligible for, um, when you think of commercial, those are people who are ineligible for public programs, either through Medicaid or Medicare. So they go to the, to the exchange to enroll, and with that they put in their financial information. And from the exchange then they are given the options for coverage. If their income status is at a certain point that would make them eligible for Medicaid, for example, they would automatically be rolled in Prime West since there's not another care, uh, Medicaid plan in our 13 counties. One of the other things, obviously, uh, you explained the, the areas are all rural Minnesota, and for the most part, these rural counties are not growing. 
Do you foresee that uh, uh, your organization here, Prime West, will probably have 35,000 people uh, five years from now, or where did you come from? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. And first of all, as of December of 2013, Prime West enrollment was at 25,000. Oh. And after the Affordable Care Act, with the expansion of Medicaid eligibility, that means they increased the income level that people could be eligible for Medicaid. We increased by over 10,000 individuals in the course of since the beginning of 2014. Um, our membership isn't so much driven by the total population of the county as it is more of the economics of a county. Where would the, uh, when you say that, I didn't mean to interrupt you, we keep on with your no. thought there, but uh, where, where are the income ranges with, would be typical with these 35,000? Oh, 000? that's a good question, and I really don't have that off the top of my head, because they do that as a, as a, a percent of the federal poverty guidelines. Okay. And I, frankly, at that point, enrollment is really a function of MNSHA, so I really don't get into those eligibility levels. But if you go on the MNSHA website, they will tell you those different eligibility categories for the different programs. Um, but the folks that are eligible for Medicaid, those are not, they're, they're in jobs, if they have jobs, those aren't paying jobs. Those aren't well-paying jobs. And uh, even with Minnesota Care, which is the basic health plan, those folks are not going to be in the best paying jobs. So that makes them eligible for the program. They can also be for eligible from circumstance in life. Uh, uh, a female, for example, who's making an okay income, uh, gets pregnant. Then by virtue of the pregnancy, becomes eligible for Medicaid and along with the baby. Um, so there's different criteria. We're going to visit with Jim on Prime West and what they do in the various counties they serve. Just an outside view of the Prime West building in Alexandria, right north of Target on the Frontage Road and the Covenant Church. Inform TV, we're in the Prime West building, uh, the old Verizon building in Alexandria. We're going to get some insight on Prime West and what that does in various counties around rural America, or rural Minnesota, I should say. Uh, Jim, introduce yourself and give us a little background on yourself as well as your company here. Yes, my name is Jim Prisabilla, I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Prime West Health. I've been at Prime West since uh, 2001 and became the CEO at that time. Uh, I've been in rural health care since 1987 and health care since 1981. Uh, a little background on Prime West. Prime West is a unique organization. It's actually owned by a group of counties, 13 counties. Uh, these counties uh, wanted to do things a bit different than having private health plans run uh, the Medicaid program and the Medicare Advantage programs in these 13 counties, as that they are all rural, and most commercial health plans are located in the Twin Cities. So they thought by running the health plan themselves, they could be more sensitive to local needs. So these counties did form the organization in 1998 and then went through the rigorous process of applying for certification to become a health plan in the state of Minnesota. Um, after that, they competed for the contracts that the state puts out for Medicaid and then later for Medicare from the federal government, were successful. And today the 13 counties and Prime West serve 35,000 individuals who are enrolled in Medicaid and those enrolled in Medicare Advantage who are also eligible for Medicaid. Uh, the interesting geography of Prime West, we're headquartered in Alexandria in Douglas County, um, but we have 13 counties that are pretty much spread from the Iowa border to uh, the Canadian border. And the reason for that is, is when the state uh, decided to allow, through legislation, allow counties to do health plan functions, not all counties wanted to do it. Uh, so the ones that did formed partnerships, which are known as joint powers agreements between governments, which is the uh, governmental term for a joint venture in the private sector. Um, and we, so we end up with uh, a county, Pipestone County, way down in the southwest. Uh, a little further to the north and east, we have Renville, uh, Meeker, and McLeod counties in that little three-county cluster. Right around Douglas County, we have Pope and Grant, Stevens and Travers. A little further west, we have Big Stone. And um, we go up north, we have uh, Beltrami, Clearwater, and Hubbard counties. So our geography is based on the counties who decided this is something they wanted to do. And they believe that by having the resource available, because it does come with significant resources, we are paying for the health care for 35,000 people, that decisions would be much more sensitive to the local providers who serve them and to the members we serve. Want to cut the point? 
As far as uh, the, the insurers in, uh, I'm sure my audience is wondering, Jim, how do you fit in with uh, Minsure, for mm -hmm. example? How do you fit in with United Healthcare? We had preferred sure. one that was uh, involved in, in uh, uh, Minsure and now pulled out. Give us a little thought process that way. Well, first of all, we don't serve a commercial population. The population we serve are individuals who have lower incomes that make them eligible for Medicaid and Minnesota Care and also for Medicare Advantage, but the ones that we serve that are Medicare are low-income seniors or individuals with disabilities. Um, so they're eligible for what they call public insurance or public program coverage. Um, so the only thing we're on the exchange for, Minsure, is for enrollment for people into Medicaid and for the Minnesota Care Program, which is now on Minsure as the Minnesota's basic health plan. And from a standpoint then, are you the insurer? Or are you still using private insurers? Or clarify no, that we, a little. We function just like a private insurer, only the source of funding, instead of coming from an employer, comes from tax dollars through the state of Minnesota for Medicaid and from the federal government for Medicare. So in essence, what the state and the federal government are doing are contracting with us to perform the health plan function locally for those 35,000 individuals. Is uh, in the process then uh, cost control, is that your number one function or the counties that uh, Prime West is made up of, of, of streamlining or give us a little thought on that? Well, the number one priority is making sure that these individuals who are vulnerable because of economic status have access to health care like the rest of us. Um, so that's our number one priority. After that, we want to ensure that the health care that they're getting is delivered with quality and then at a fair price. And that's where the cost comes in. We want to make sure that the services that are provided are medically necessary and needed by the individual. But above all, it's making sure that our individuals can access the needed health care they need in a timely manner. And from a standpoint of the, your model, what are the counties, obviously we have a number of counties in the area that could become part of you, I would think. Uh, are, how, do you, how do you see that uh, shaking out? Well, that's a good question. We started out as 10 counties. The three northern counties, Beltrami, Clearwater, and Hubbard, they joined us in 2008. We'd already been in business with the southern 10 counties for five years. Um, those counties were not yet under what they call managed care, and that's basically what we do. Uh, the state has a set of contracts with health plans to deliver care locally. Um, they had still been under, under, under an old program and had yet to make the decision to either have the state contract with private health plans or they themselves do what we do at Prime West to be the health plan themselves as counties. Um, when push came to shove, they thought it would be easier and more expeditious if they could join Prime West. So. Our counties uh, put the criteria together that we would to allow additional counties to join Prime West, and those counties pretty much hit all the checks in a positive way, and it was a decision made by the existing 10 counties to uh, uh, invite them to join Prime West. Um, since our beginning, uh, because we have been successful, other counties have approached us, but um, they haven't met the criteria that we need, the, the owner counties need, to, to make that happen. We continue to get approached but again, we kind of hold up that same criteria that's been developed by our owner counties because they are looking for a good match, a good chemistry between the counties in terms of how this organization is governed, what's the philosophy, because it is a very much a locally driven philosophy. It's not about the dollars. It's about the access and to care and the, the efficient delivery of health care. Um, so our expansion is pretty much the last time we really expanded was in 2008 with the northern counties. We don't anticipate it. Uh, growing to uh, additional counties, at least in the foreseeable future. You know, uh, um, in this whole process of health care uh, with the Minsure project and uh, the preferred one, uh, can give us a little overthought mm -hmm. as far as how you as a health professional see uh, the health process uh, evolving with uh, the new health environment. Uh, now we've got change in Congress, uh, yet uh, we still have uh, um, basically this, the uh, same legislative bran uh, branches that we changed uh, uh, a leadership uh, with the Republicans in the House. Give us a, a little overview on your thought of health care and, and of course relating to mm -hmm. you and our, and our communities. Sure. A big part of the Affordable Care Act or also known as Obamacare was really the first part was extending access to health care coverage so people could afford to seek and get health care. Um, the big part that it's focusing on now, and that was going to be the enrollment through the exchanges, the health insurance exchanges, which in Minnesota is called Minsure. 
Um, the big emphasis I think where we're heading now is what can we do to continue to finance that because when we extend access through the taxpayer dollar, it's going to end up to be an economic equation. Can we afford to sustain that access over an extended period of time? Uh, so part of the ACA does contemplate um, greater accountability for cost across the whole system. So I think where we're going to head now is greater provider, healthcare provider accountability in the cost equation. And that's known in, in, in the healthcare reform now as accountable care. So there's more arrangements, whereas it used to be we pay providers, um, you pay providers basically on their volume. The more services they provide, the more we pay them. It's more toward also in addition to that, or a bit of that, would move over to what we call a fee for value. Are we getting a good quality outcome? Is the individual returning to the quality of life they enjoyed before the, the onset of the illness or, or disease or accident? Um, is that care delivered in the most cost-effective manner? Um, are the uh, tools and the, the therapies that are being delivered, are those the ones that will uh, render the most cost-effective outcome? And cost-effective is both a quality and cost equation. I think when people think of cost-effective, they only think of the, the cost side. Did we reduce costs? Well, you can easily reduce costs by nipping quality. Uh, but we, the cost effectiveness equation is a value equation and we want to make sure that, um, that the value we get for the healthcare spend is there. And of course the United States leads the country in terms, of, leads the world in terms of expenditures in terms of a per capita basis, but at the same time our healthcare status as a population ranks quite low among uh, developed nations around the world. So at that trend, uh, the health system that we have it today